Okay, everybody, and good <coughs> evening, Democrats. Good evening, Democrats. All right, some some chit chat still in the room. I see some some people are muted in the Zoom, so let's try that again. And good evening, Democrats. Good evening, Democrats. So, uh, for for those who are here in the room, you can see the Zoom going on up on the screen. But I'm going to turn the zoom around for a second so everyone can see. We got a really packed house here in person as well. So welcome everybody in here, out there. Uh, we're we're glad to have you for for this in person and Zoom hybrid meeting of the Santa Monica Democratic Club. I want to thank everybody for choosing to be here instead of watching the Republican debate tonight. And I have to say, I'm really surprised the RNC decided to counter-program this meeting with a debate. I mean, debate. I, I actually called Ronna Romney McDaniel and said, hey, listen, we have a Santa Monica Democratic Club meeting at that time. Uh, I think you should reschedule. Uh, for some reason, they must have missed the email or something. I don't know what happened. <laughs> uh, really quick poll of the room. Raise your hand if you've been indicted four times this year. Any, nobody? Oh, Derek, never mind, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> right, right, right. Okay, well, we've got a great program tonight. In a few minutes, we're going to be taking a deep dive into the future of the Santa Monica Airport. We've got a great panel with lots of different ideas represented on how that we can proceed once the airport closes in 2028. But first, we have some club business yeah. to take care of, yes, including our first endorsements of the 2020 cycle. We can do any Zooming from here. I'm gonna mute everybody um, soon. Think about it, okay? Okay, and uh, before we get to the endorsement vote, we have some announcements. Please welcome our communications VP, Susan Shu. <laughs> Black family survived slavery. We survived. Everyone, thank you so much. Could you all please mute because you're interrupting the sound here if you aren't muted at home? Things like this to see so many people. So back at the uh, hospitality station, I have some food, and next to the food are two things that are not food, and one of them are postcards in individual twenty-five uh, postcard packs to Virginia. And it sounds really strange. Who who needs me to tell them why Virginia is important this year? Probably everyone. Uh, Virginia is having a very, very important election this year in November um, that <coughs> determines their state legislature. And if we give them, if we help them turn out the vote and help them turn their legislature blue, it'll deprive Glenn Youngkin of a victory that his MAGA donors are looking for. Because um, I've understood from the people who are in the state legislature that He's kind of lying in wait for you know Trump to fail or something. He, they're really planning. A lot of MAGA donors are planning for Glenn Youngkin, the uh, the uh, governor of Virginia, to be the next uh, Trump. So if we can help the Virginians get back their legislature, and that's all about turning out the vote, um, like with our postcards, we can help them uh, make the whole country a lot more democratic. So if anyone wants to take some postcards, I'm going to have you sign them out. I'll sit back there. And the other thing I have for you is um, a little democracy library that I put together of some brand new books and some not so new books. And some of them are about Los Angeles in the 60s and some of them are about the climate. And we're gonna be adding to it. And I'm also gonna ask anyone who wants to sign out anything to sign it out for a month and bring it back in a month. There's two brand new books that just got published in the last two days, including many other books. One of them is 50 Years of This Magazine, and one of them is uh, Heather Cox Richardson's Democracy Awakening. So those are pretty hot books if you want to, they're brand new. Anyway, thank you so much, and be sure to sign out anything you take, and then we'll see you next month. Thank you so much. All right. Where were we? All right, we want to let everybody know about our next two meetings to round out the year. We're going to have a meeting on October 18th on the subject of education 
And one of our confirmed guests will be the school district's new superintendent, Dr. Antonio Shelton. So we're excited about that meeting. And on November 15th, for the final membership meeting of the year, we've got a really nice event. There's the Republican debate tonight, but on November 15th, we're going to have a candidate's debate for the LA County District Attorney's Office. And uh, we there's going to be between the incumbent, George Gascon, and the six Democrats who are running to challenge him for re-election. And I can tell you that all seven of those candidates have confirmed attendance for that meeting. So that will be right here in this room. Uh, so that'll be really exciting. Okay. So we're about to take a vote to endorse in the presidential and U.S. Senate primaries. And our executive committee voted to recommend President Joe Biden for a second term. And I think the track record of his first term is self-evident, but just to make clear, think back to where you were in January, 2021, until now, and all of the work that the Biden administration has done since then to turn our country around from the previous administration. The biggest reduction in unemployment since the Great Depression, the bipartisan infrastructure deal, the Inflation Reduction Act, just to name a few, we could go on for a long time about all of his accomplishments. The Republican nominee in 2024 is very likely to be someone who's not on the Republican stage tonight, Donald Trump, or at least somebody like Ron DeSantis who believes in all the same policies and politics that Trump brought into our democracy. And therefore, this election is going to be an existential threat to our democracy. And there's no one better to stand up for our Democratic Party values than President Joe Biden. And that's just a very short, abbreviated reason why our board feels very strongly about not only endorsing, but working really hard in the next year and a half to reelect President Joe Biden. And turning to the Senate race, the executive committee did not reach a consensus on which candidate to recommend. And the reason is, and I say this with complete sincerity, not for political reasons, not to uh, appear neutral. We are really choosing between three great A-plus candidates in this race. It's not the lesser of evils problem that we sometimes have when you look at a primary field and you're like, well, the least bad one is this one. No, we have three really great candidates. And any of these candidates would represent California very well in the US Senate. Earlier this year, over the summer, we heard from all three Democratic candidates running for Senate, Adam Schiff, Katie Porter, and Barbara Lee. They each addressed our club directly and answered the same set of questions. Those meetings were posted on YouTube and shared with our membership and people on our email list. Hopefully, those of you who are planning to vote tonight had a chance to watch those meetings live or watch the YouTube recording as you considered who to support. But before we open the voting, which is going to happen in just a few minutes, we have representatives sent from each campaign uh, to make closing arguments. And we've asked the campaigns to designate up to two club members each to speak to you tonight. So first up, uh, representing Katie Porter's campaign is former Santa Monica mayor, Sue Himorich. Thank you, John. Thank you to everybody who's here. It's so great to be in person, and I'm hearing you. Uh, I have one minute to tell you why to vote for Katie Porter, but let me just say that I could be talking about any of our candidates because we have a wealth of riches this year. But I have supported Katie Porter for this election and in Congress, and the reason I supported her are really three. One, she takes no corporate money. I think that that's important. When I was running, I didn't take corporate money. I think that it changes the dialogue when you're taking money from the corporations. 
that we're trying to uh, control. Uh, the second of all, she's from a mixed district, a district that has a lot of Republicans. So I know she can talk to Republicans. And I think that it's important to be able to talk to everybody. I think that any candidate we pick needs to be able to talk to everybody in the state, including the Republicans in the state and represent them. And uh, uh, finally, I think that she is a candidate of the future. If you look at the polling of these three candidates, you'll see that people 29 and under strongly favor Katie Porter. I think there's a reason for that. I think she is a candidate for the future. I am doing my best now as I am not the future to try to vote with its future and not with my past. So I really encourage all of you to do, as I say, and I strongly endorse Katie Porter for Senator of California. Thank you, Stu. And uh, we uh, haven't heard from the campaign about a second speaker, so I want to open up to the floor. Is there anybody here who's supporting uh, Katie Porter for Senate who'd like to speak for one minute? Okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, come on up. <laughs> Oh, I really did not intend to do this. Um, I've uh, met her personally and spent time with her, and um, I went to her, and she convinced me. She one thing that she does, and she's really good at, is that she goes and she helps other candidates. She knows how to. She teaches candidates how to speak to Republicans. She she's she works for the whole, not just herself. She spreads her wealth, her knowledge, and experience around in a way that, as much as I adore Adam Schiff, that's not one of his things. And uh, she puts a lot of time and effort into to the whole view of the whole. Like I said, I'm not good at, it. but anyway. So that that's one of my other reasons besides. The ones just stated, which I all agree with. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, now we will hear from two representatives from Adam Schiff's campaign. Uh, first up, a DNC member and the so called king of 8051, <laughs> Derek Deverman. Uh, hello, everyone. As John said, I am one of your elected members to the PNC, and I'm here because I endorse Adam Schiff. A few things that I wrote down to explain to you why I think we should all vote for Adam Schiff. Well, first of all, we all know that he led the Trump impeachment. Everyone knows that. Everybody saw it. Everybody saw him stand up to the Republicans when it was politically risky and actually got kicked off two campaigns. Strike that. He got kicked off uh, committees because of that. But here's some things you might not know. He was one of the original co-sponsors of the Green New Deal. He wishes to pass his constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United to make corporations not, I see, to make corporations not uh, count as people in terms of uh, campaign donations. And he wishes to abolish the filibuster. He's endorsed by me. He's endorsed by Speaker Pelosi. Everybody's heard of her? <laughs> He's endorsed by Ted Lieu, Henry Waxman, uh, Henry, Henry Stern, um, ben, Allen. ben Allen. I knew I almost got it right. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Council Member Tarosis, Count uh, Dr. Shai Roy, and me. And I think you should vote for him because of that. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, thank you, Derek. And now we'll hear from Santa Monica City Council member Carolyn Tarosis. Hi, everyone. Good to see you. Um, hard out to follow Derek Dermot, but hi, everyone. I'm Carolyn Tarosis. I'm one of your council members on the Santa Monica City Council. And simply put, Adam Schiff is the right choice for Santa Monica. He's the coalition candidate. 
He's endorsed over 60% of our congressional delegation. And he actually has a track record of getting stuff done, not just delivering talking points. As someone who works for the County of LA, I know how important it is to deliver the resources to the folks who need it. Um, he is someone that we can trust. He is the only candidate from Los Angeles. He uniquely knows this club. Um, he's also the candidate of labor. He's the only one who has statewide labor endorsements, IATSE, IAFF, the firefighters, the uh, California Nevada International Union of Operating Engineers, IBEW, the Amalgamated Transit Union. None of the other candidates have any statewide labor endorsements. Um, and most importantly, he's supporting Medicare for all. He's trying to expand voting rights for all. He's passing a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United and reform campaign finance, which Derek Dermont said, and I think is very, very important. Um, he was the original co-sponsor of the Green New Deal when it was introduced. He is a progressive candidate. I know people want to paint him some, as something else. I think we're so lucky that we have three amazing candidates in this race, but simply put, Adam, I think he's going to win. We want to be with him when he does, and he speaks for Santa Monica. He's so important to this club that we named an award after him at our last Sammy's. So if that doesn't say something, then I don't know what does. Adam Schiff for California Senate. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. And uh, finally, we'll hear from representatives for the Barbara Lee campaign. First up will be uh, our president of our partner club, the uh, progressive Democrats of the Santa Monica Mountains, Dorothy Wright. Hi, great to be here to represent Barbara Lee. If people ask me, who do you support? I just go, are you joking with me? Because Barbara Lee speaks for me. When Barbara Lee was in college, her political science professor told her she had to work on a political campaign in order to, to get course credit. She was in London until she found Shirley Chisholm. Then she went to work for Ron Dellens and the rest is history. By the way, Barbara Lee proposed the first single payer Bill, along with Diane Watson, way back in 1998. So, there are two existential issues facing us today, war and global warming. And the only person we can count on, on both of those issues, is Barbara Lee. Barbara Lee has proposed legislation to take money out of the floating Pentagon budget and give it to those who need it. She's also she was also the only one who stood up and voted against the AUMF, the, the um, Authorization for Military Funding in um, in the Afghan War. You can trust Barbara Lee to do the right thing. On global warming, she passed bill. She proposed bill on women and climate change, and a, and a bill to educate children about climate change. War is the biggest emitter of global warming pollution. It's a double whammy, and Barbara Lee is on top of both these issues, global warming and ending wars, or at least cutting that bloated Pentagon budget and using the money to help people. The Pentagon has not passed an audit in over a decade. We need Barbara Lee in the Senate. She is the real deal. She will fight for our planet as well as our country and our state. Barbara Lee speaks for me, and I think she speaks for all of us. Thank you, Dorothy. And now, last but certainly not least, the NC member and probably the person I've known longer than anybody else in this room, Susie Shannon. Hey everyone, I'm Susie Shannon. I'm also an elected member of the DNC, along with Barbara Lee, who is also an elected member of the DNC. I have been a member of this club since the early 2000s, and I really think Barbara Lee best represents on the principles of this Democratic Club. She has been a leader on climate change issues. Um, she started the Out of Poverty Caucus in Congress. She um, supported and authored a Renters' Bill of Rights, student loan forgiveness, comprehensive immigration reform, um, subsidies for restaurants and small business during COVID. Um, she, as Dorothy said, has been a leader on single-payer health care long before it was trendy. We all know that when things start to trend, politicians come on board. She's been a leader and a trailblazer on these issues. Um, she put housing as a human right in our DNC platform. She's part of our Democratic Party. 
family. She was a co-sponsor of the Housing for All Act to address of the affordable housing shortage. She's worked very um, you know, strongly on uh, homeless issues. Um, I am actually the founder of the DNC Poverty Council. And when the DNC didn't want that council, it was Barbara Lee who stood up in a, at a, during our general session and said, we need this caucus and made that happen. Um, she's also worked to stop Trump's policy, um, which was to deny green cards uh, for immigrants who are on Medicaid. Um, she cares about low-income communities. The Democratic Party is really a one-stop shop for people um, who are at or below the poverty level. She really helps to support those communities. A lot of these folks, they don't have a union, they don't have people backing them, they have the Democratic Party, and they have the members of Congress um, who help to get all of these policies passed. I've always been able to count on her. She's endorsed by Karen Bass, She's endorsed by Dolores Huerta. If you don't know um, Barbara Lee, I'm sure you know Dolores Huerta. I'm sure you know Karen Bass. And I'm sure that you know that their judgment actually counts a lot. So I hope that you'll support her tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susie. And thank you to all of our speakers today. Um, so the choice now comes up to you, the voting members of the club. Um, so just a bit of process on this. The voting is going to open for the race at 7.30 p.m., which is six minutes from now. Uh, th that's already happening, and it's going to happen. Uh, I don't have to click anything. The emails are going to come in probably while I'm standing here uh, at 7.30 p.m. You'll get an email from Election Buddy with a unique link that only you can use to vote on your phone while you're watching the rest of this meeting. Whether you're here in person, whether you're watching it on Zoom, uh, the emails will come in. Uh, you will have an hour to vote until 8.30 p.m. So if you're a member in good standing of the club and you RSVP'd using the Google form and received the email from us this morning or this afternoon, uh, you should expect to receive the election buddy email. If you are both of those things and you didn't receive an email at say 7.30, 7.35 or so, uh, please reach out to me, reach out to our political action VP, Dan Hall, standing, sitting back there. Uh, reach out to our membership VP, Mike Soloff, sitting right next to him. If you're on Zoom and, and you don't get an email, uh, reach out to our designated Zoom room liaison, Patricia Hoffman. I'm sure she's waving uh, on the first screen right now. Uh, or any member of our executive board, if, if you don't, if you want to talk to somebody else that you know is on our board, just reach out. They'll point you in the right direction. We'll help you get sorted out. In addition to the three candidates' names, you'll also see options for no endorsement and abstain <laughs> on the ballot. To be clear, no endorsement means that you don't believe the club should endorse any of the three candidates. For whatever reason, there's many reasons one might feel that way, but you don't believe that you, you want us to not make an endorsement tonight. Separately, abstain means that you don't want to cast a vote in the endorsement process. If you select abstain, your vote doesn't count towards the total number of votes cast. So it's just, let's say you wanted to vote for Joe Biden, but you didn't want to vote in the Senate race, or vice versa, then you would uh, you know, select abstain. Okay, and this is important, how the process is going to count. If a candidate gets to 55% of the vote or higher at 8.30 p.m. when we look at the results, we'll announce the winner at that time. If, however, no one reaches that threshold, we'll have a round two. We'll still reveal the results and share with everybody what, what happened, but uh, we'll go on to round two. So that means you must be sure to pay attention later tonight. If you're a voter, don't go to sleep at 8.30. Stay tuned because there may be a round two. Uh, there's always a lower turnout in round two. So, you know, make sure you're paying close attention uh, for that second email to potentially go out. Round two, we're going to eliminate any of the candidates that get below 20%. So there would probably just be two candidates listed on the ballot at that time, plus the options of no endorsement and abstain. 
Okay, now we're going to switch gears to the main event of the evening, our discussion on the future of the Santa Monica Airport. And I want to clarify the club's position because there have been some rumors going around online on certain email lists, as happens in Santa Monica sometimes. <laughs> this club strongly supported Measure LC in 2014 and campaigned for it. Therefore, our position remains in support of a grand park taking the space of the airport once it closes in a few years. We're not doing this meeting in order to push a particular outcome. Uh, there's lots of other ideas about what could happen in this space, and we wanted to create an informational opportunity to hear about what those ideas are. This is a club that represents all Democrats in Santa Monica, even though we've been accused of not being that from time to time. And as such, we want to be a welcoming space for people with all different ideas. We didn't invite anybody who was going to speak about turning it into uh, the new RNC headquarters, for example. But anything that a Democrat might reasonably want to see in that space, we want to hear about those ideas. The reason we're doing a meeting on this topic now is that back in January at a city council meeting, uh, staff presented on where things stand, and we're going to hear a version of that in a few minutes. Uh, many of us may have forgotten about since Measure LC passed that in 2028, the city council is going to have to take a vote to affirmatively close down the airport, as well as the decision to go ahead with a park or another option uh, that the residents choose before that. It's possible that a future council or even a signature gathering initiative could put a measure on the ballot that would propose keeping the airport open or creating housing in that space or other potential uses for that land. And therefore, even though Measure LC clearly indicated what Santa Monicans want to see in 2014, we have to continue to reiterate to our city council, which is always changing in composition, what we expect to see in 2028. With that in mind, we're going to hear from a series of speakers tonight, one at a time, who will each bring a different perspective to this conversation. First, we'll hear from a member of city staff on the status of where things stand now. Then we'll hear from three different advocates promoting different ideas on how to use the airport land. Those are creating a, a grand park, creating housing, or keeping the airport open for use uh, as an aviation space. And finally, we're going to hear about the concept of citizens' assemblies, which is an idea for how to receive public engagement and input on this topic. First up, I'd like to welcome the Senior Design Manager from the Department of Public Works in Santa Monica, Amber Rushing. All right. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for having me tonight. My name is Amber Shane, as uh, John mentioned. I'm the Acting Chief Operating Officer for Public Works, and I'm leading the public process for the future of the Santa Monica Airport. Mm -hmm. Try saying that five times fast. Um, so tonight, I was just going to give an overview of where we have been and where we are headed, or at least we expect to head, um, and uh, we'll just get started. So the airport has been with Santa Monica for a long time. It has been a center of innovation and inspiration, right? It has hit 100 years this year. I think this past weekend, it just celebrated the 99th anniversary of the first circumnavigation of the globe. So it has this deep connection to Santa Monica, right? Douglas was, and still is, the largest employer that Santa Monica has ever had. Uh, the Sunset Park area was largely developed as housing for the, the uh, manufacturing of airplanes for World War II. And so it has this deep history of how Santa Monica has evolved. Today, it has around 166 businesses. It covers 43 different industries. And it's used for not only uh, aviation, right, but there's recreation there. My kids play soccer here. 
Um, we've got museums, right? We've got uh, live theater that occurred. We've got an art center. We have an educational facility with SMC. And of course, we have some retail and restaurant spaces. Just if you haven't been to the Cloverfield, their outside area is one of the nicest places, I think, to go grab something to eat. So it's it's a special place. However, for decades, the city has been trying to work with the FAA to do better, to pay better neighbor, and ultimately to close. Right? We spent much time over many councils trying to do this. And in 2017, the consent decree was signed between the FAA and the city of Santa Monica, which, as John mentioned, allows us to close the airport at the end of 2028. Now, there's still some things that council needs to do. It's not 100% that, but that's the questions that we've gotten as well. So there's still a few things that we need to do, but there's clear intention there. Um, and I pair that with LC. So in 2014, as I'm sure you're all very well aware, uh, LC was passed, right? And 60% 60, 60 of the vote approved it, saying that we we're only going to have uh, recreational, educational, cultural uses on the lands. Um, and I've also heard, right, well, we voted on it. We did this already. But the process that we're going forward with, or the, the reason why there's a process at all, is what does that mean? What uses are in the park? There's a lot of different options. Right, what cultural and educational spaces are there? Are there other community needs that are also important that we balance? Right, we're a community of eight point four square miles, ninety thousand people. To convert a park of two hundred and twenty seven acres would be a lot of money, right? And so we just need to be able to balance the resources that we have with the needs that we have and the goals and within the regulatory frameworks and policies that we have as a city. So. Where have we been? Uh, to date. So in January of this year, we went to council and said, please tell us to start <laughs> this process so that we can start to get things in place so that we're ready for 2028 when it comes around. Uh, staff suggested an RFQ to RFP process. What that allowed us to do is to get qualifications from a wide variety of firms to talk to us about how would you help support our community in determining what should be you know, at the airport. Uh, so we released that in February. It closed in March. We had 27 teams respond. And from that, we shortlisted eight. Um, I'm going to share with you a website at the end. So if you haven't been to the future of Santa Monica Airport, um, if you Google that, all of this information is on there. And so you can go look up the RFQ. You can look up the staff report, which is a wealth of information. So however, you know, deep you want to dig, uh, please go. Uh, so then in May, we released the RFP to those eight shortlisted teams. And then the, the RFP was due in June. We invited five teams to interview. And then we made a uh, choice uh, that would be our recommendation to council, which we're expecting to go in November of this year for the team. That's kind of what brought us to here. Um, so the folks on the team, right, as I said, myself, Amber Rochain, uh, we have Chris Dishlip, Dishlip, who is our assistant director, Amelia Feichner, who leads our architecture services team, and Alex Perry, who's the senior design manager. As part of this process, going from the RFQ to the RFP, we knew community outreach was going to be really important, and that we wanted to do things, our, our council challenged us to do things in an innovative way to be more inclusive of all of Santa Monica. And so from that, um, those suggestions, uh, we are recommending, which is why Wayne will come talk to you in a little bit in more um, uh, specificity, about a democratic lottery process or a lottery selection process. It goes by a lot of different names. Uh, so Healthy Democracy is who we are recommending uh, to help lead through that process. And I'll go through that in just a little bit. I'm just going to go very high level so that Wayne can kind of give you the, the deep dive. And then the part of this team that I started out talking about is the design and technical team. So they are in support of the panel. So as the, the community panel would be meeting and deliberating and, and doing their work, which I'll talk about, um, they would have the support of the design and technical team. And that means that right, they will have a uh, access to economic analysis, to traffic analysis, to air quality analysis, to tree cover, right? All of those sorts of things that we want to know 
that those 227 acres can get turned into realistically in an incremental way so that there's a plan for day one and there's a grand plan at the end we can get to that. So there, these two pieces will work together to build, um, to build, to, to work through what the future will hold. So the RFP scopes of work, as I mentioned, right, a document review. The airport has a long history. They're going to review all of that. Uh, they're going to do an existing conditions report. Because believe it or not, we don't actually have very good maps of the whole airport site. We've got lots of parts and pieces. Um, we know there's, you know, there's some soil reports and some historic analysis and things like that. So they're going to dig in and really provide a good basis of understanding of what is actually there, what's reusable, what's not, what uh, needs renovation. Um, they're going to work with the lottery selected panel, as I mentioned, and they'll be working with the panel as well in those scenario planning and analyses. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time on the lottery selected panel. So if you've heard of it, um, it comes by a lot of different names. Oh, I apologize, the closed captioning's in there, but it, they're also called citizen assemblies or citizen juries. Um, and what it does is it's a demographic representative, representative sample of Santa Monica, so using US Census data. And what we do, uh, well, what healthy democracies would do, right? Um, because they would be, this is their process, right? That the, they would run this so that um, it's sort of a separate from this, City necessarily process. So healthy democracy will be sending out 15 to 20,000 mailers to random residents. So the city will be doing an education campaign. So I don't know about you, but sometimes you get stuff in the mail and you don't know what it is. You may not look at it <laughs> or at least don't look at it right away. So people will, will, will do a big education campaign on what this is and what it looks like and why you might want to participate. So they'll be randomly uh, sent out. Uh, people will opt in. So much like um, uh, they'll fill out their uh, information, then hundreds and hundreds of different panels that will target the demographics of Santa Monica will be created. Then there is a panel selection event that is a public event, and we pick a panel, which we expect to be around 40 people, uh, and then an alternate, just in case anybody needs to drop off, and then the panel can begin their work. So why this process was really interesting is that it really removes barriers. So one of the things that we find in tra traditional outreach processes is that folks feel like there's sort of a, a winner-loser dynamic or that staff did not interpret what the community was saying appropriately, that we, we missed a step or we didn't include all of the opinions, right? Um, we, we get lots of feedback and it's we, you see it in a lot of um, the large planning documents that we've done that spend a lot of time. And so what this does is allows folks from all of Santa Monica to participate, right? It removes those barriers like language translation. A lot of our stuff to date has only been in English. So if you are a native Spanish speaker, you may not understand what it's saying. So things like that. Um, also, people whose life circumstances don't afford them to be able to go to a community meeting. Maybe they don't have reliable transportation, or maybe they don't, um, you know, they, they, they have things in their everyday life that they're not able to participate on a community meeting right at seven o'clock at night. Um, so what this panel does is kind of remove those barriers of the idea of this panel. Um, they are a deep deliberative body, which is very exciting. Um, and this is where um, the panel will be presented with a slate of balanced information, much like tonight, where you're going to hear a lot of different opinions. That's the type of information that the panel will receive, that it is a balanced set of information, and then they make choices. Uh, they will actually get to call other stakeholders in that they want to talk to or other people in the community that they want to hear from. And so they will actually decide what information they want to hear about so that they can make good decisions. Uh, this work will occur over six weekends, over nine months. So it's a it's a commitment. It's a time commitment, um, and that is. It also affords really good information and outcomes. There's also a lot of opportunity for the panel to interact with the community um, through various online surveys and things. There's workshops. There's all sorts of throughout, throughout that whole process. There's a lot of ways for community members to participate with the, the panel and provide information. Uh, the deliberative wave, as they call it, right? So this is a process that we see a lot in Europe, less so in the US, uh, but more and more we are seeing it here because 
of the um, quality of the information and recommendations that come out of this. And these are recommendations that go directly to council. And so again, staff is here to support. Our design and technical team is here to support the community panel, but the panel speaks for itself. They write their own reports, typos and all, <laughs> and they will deliver them directly to council. So we, we, we feel that that is a more equitable and interesting process so that we can talk directly to the uh, council. Mm -hmm. One uh, way that we've heard about this or a, a project to take a look at, you can look at the bottom of the screen here, that uh, website is Petaluma. <laughs> City of Petaluma in Northern California has a 55 acre parcel of land that has historically been their county fair. And it has been for a hundred years and they pay a dollar a year <laughs> in rent. And so their community was really struggling with should we renew this lease or not? Their community that almost went bankrupt four or five years ago. And so the opportunity for 55 acres is really interesting. And it was very divisive. Their community was at each other's throats. So their city manager brought in healthy democracy and did a, a, a lottery selected panel with them. You can see that their panel was about 36 people and that they um, worked for over two months together to come to an agreement. Um, this process works not for consensus necessarily, but for collaboration and understanding. There's room for all voices. And so the city manager at Petaluma has said this is the best money that they ever spent because it really helped heal their community and came out with great um, actionable uh, work. So a few things um, that we get a lot of questions on uh, is that there will be, as I mentioned, a lot of opportunity for community input um, that the panel presents to council, but council still has the final say. This does not usurp them. They can revise it. They can accept it. They can make changes. They can reject it. So, but they will have that dialogue with the panel um, itself, right? So they'll, they'll have a, a spokesperson. Um, and also that this process does not supplant the planning process, right? So this is to get to a preferred alternative if you're used to planning language, right? So we look at lots of different options. Hopefully we'll be able to come to consensus around one. And then that traditional planning process with specific plans and zoning and general land use and all those things will then occur. Uh, but this is this community outreach process so that we can get a good basis of understanding of what Santa Monica Santa Monicans actually want to happen on those 227 acres. And then my last slide is just where what's coming up. That um, September, I don't know if all of you got to see that the info item came out uh, this week. Please go take a look at it. It's also on the website. That'll give you sort of an overview of the lottery select panel. Uh, then in October 10th, is the study session for this specific process. Please come join us, ask questions, and hopefully learn a little bit too. November 14th is when we're expecting to go for the two contracts. So we'll revise them from the feedback that we get in October and present them to council so that we can move forward. And we look forward to starting in January as a project kickoff. That'll be part of that education campaign that I was talking about, and, um, a community outreach process to get to the panel process. And then we expect the panel's first weekend to be roughly a year from now. And then it'll run nine months. It loosely follows the school calendar so that folks are here uh, more so, or we hope. Um, and so their sixth weekend will be um, in early summer of 2025, if all goes as planned. So with that, thank you so much. I think we're sticking around for questions after. Um, but this is the website that I'm talking about. If you'd like to follow up with any information, please do so. And I will hand it to the next presenter. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And just a quick reminder on the voting. Uh, unfortunately, if you're not a member of Midstanding of the Club, you will not receive a ballot to vote. But it's a good reminder to become a member for next year because we're going to have a lot of voting opportunities in the election. Okay, our next speaker is from Airport to Park, Michael Brodsky. Hey everybody, thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you.
boots and mouse on the other screen, and the mouse is on the other screen. The joys of technology. Okay. Thanks so much for having me here. My name is Michael Brodsky, and if you don't know me, I'm a professor at Loyola Marymount University. I'm an environmental educator, a climate reality leader, uh, and I'm on the board of uh, the Santa Monica Airport to Park Foundation. And I've been involved with park creation since I was 20 years old. That's me when I was 20 years old at the um, uh, Point Reyes National Seashore, trying to make that a national park. People said we could never get that done. Uh, they did a documentary called The Rebels with a Cause, How the Battle Over Land Changed the Landscape Forever. Uh, it's a fabulous film. You should see it, and you will notice that I'm in it for 3.8 seconds. <laughs> My parents were really proud. Um, we need to solve environmental problems. We have a lot of them with equitable nature, natural uh, based solutions, and I forgot to turn on my block here. Okay. And you've probably heard that Santa Monica Airport has some serious, um, serious problems. Not getting anything out. Okay, uh, some serious problems. It has toxic lead from the small planes. It has ultrafine particulates from the jets. It has forever chemicals, fossil fuel carbon waste for all the planes that fly, hazardous noise, stormwater runoff, heat island effects, lack of equitable access, and yes, crashes, and uh, right in the middle of a, a residential neighborhood. And for decades, people have been working to uh, remediate and close that problem. Uh, shout outs here to Virginia Ernst and uh, the late Bill Rosendahl, uh, uh, Ted Liu, uh, Marty Rubin, and hundreds of other people that work to make us bring us to the spot where we are today. So we can turn these problems into solutions, and we can do that by reclaiming our great park. And that's where Santa Monica Airport found uh, Santa Monica uh, Airport to Park Foundation comes in. Uh, we've been working with the community for nine years now to help realize this dream that the community wants as to create a great park to replace the airport. And we've collaborated with such people as uh, James Rojas to make equitable access to parks and communities, and uh, Mark Rios, the great landscape architecture, and so many people that you may even recognize in this picture as part of the community that are working to create a great park. So some quick park history that people often don't know about. In the 1920s, Santa Monica uh, planned for our future park needs like many cities have. In 1926, they purchased land in a park spawn to create a park for the purpose of a park. And that park was located at Sentinella and uh, Central Avenue, which is today Ocean Park Boulevard. And it consisted of playgrounds, tennis courts, playing fields, horseshoe, lawn bowling, archery range, shooting range, recreation center, 18 hole golf course, and an airfield. And that was our great park. It was our city's biggest park. In this picture on the right, you can see the golf course, you can see the tennis courts, and in the middle, you can see the practice fields, and then the multi-use field right at the base of the runway was used for football and baseball and then uh, lawn bowling on the left. Uh, this is an aerial view from 1928 when the park was created, and you can see the space in the green is the park that was dedicated to the recreational uses, and then the brown part is the airport. This is an early Thomas guide showing the distribution of the airfield and the park space showing tennis courts, clubhouse, archery range, pistol range, and golf course. This was a big deal for the city when it opened. Uh, and they had Clover Field Day to celebrate this happening. And it was considered the brightest jewel in Santa Monica's uh, crown. Uh, the golf course was a PGA golf course, held two PGA golf tournaments. Uh, and it was used for all sorts of recreational activities. That's Carol Lombard learning how to uh, feed shoot for a movie that she was doing. Uh, early maps of uh, tourist guides show a municipal golf course, a scored ski shooting, archery range, and um, it just was considered our greatest asset. All was good until 1941, when war broke out and the U.S. government took control of our biggest park. And by 1945, they bulldozed the park and they moved the airfield from its original location, where the business park is today, and they moved it 
Whereas today, it's on top of where the park was. So the airport is actually sitting on our great park. So how did this impact our um, city's park space? It decimated our city's park space. We measure park space by uh, park acres per thousand residents. Uh, average for the United States and for California is 10 acres per thousand residents. Where is Santa Monica? I don't know if you can read it, but look all the way down at the bottom of the list. That's where Santa Monica is. Pretty dreadful, 1.4 acres per thousand uh, residents. If you look at the largest parks in LA County, uh, we only have a 26 acre park as our largest park. And so we're three quarters of the way down this list. So pretty dreadful once again. And if you look at percentage of parkland um, that we have in the city, we're way down at the bottom of the list once again at 2.5. Yeah, we have a whole ocean and beach. Uh, number. Uh, in 2016, the LA County Parks Needs Assessment looked at all the areas of the county, and they determined that Santa Monica had between a high to a very high need for park space. And um, Mar Vista and Del Rey, right next to the butts to the airport, has it even worse. They have 0.5 acres per thousand uh, and are considered high, uh, high need for park space. And it will only get worse as population increases. So population can change. This is 1940. Uh, now we see freeways, and this is 2020. Um, the state certified housing element mandates that go on cycles, if each cycle is continued, here's an amazing fact that people might not be aware, but the population of Santa Monica will double in just 32 years. And so the park space that we have will drop to a really dismal 0.75 acres. Mar Vista will drop to 0.25, uh, and it will continue to drop as generations and decades move on. So looking at a city uh, that's also gone through change, like Vancouver, uh, the top picture is uh, 1970, the bottom picture is 2014, quite a change. But here's an amazing fact. Right now, that city has 3.4 acres per thousand residents and 11% of their land. So they did not take the park space to create housing. They figured out housing could work around the park and the park could actually uh, support that future housing. Santa Monica, on the other hand, in 32 years, will have 0.75 acres per thousand residents at just 2.5% of the land. And people moving into this housing will not have a backyard and a front yard like traditional single family residents they will need parks more than ever. So we need our great park. Santa Monica residents support a great park. And in 2014, Santa Monica residents passed Measure LC that said no new development on the land should be allowed other than parks and open spaces. 2017, the council voted Resolution 1126 to close Santa Monica Airport, and now we're in the planning process. So it's so exciting to hear that we're moving forward to this point and so keep in mind, we can go ahead and build a park, but anything other than a park is gonna require a vote of the people. And here's an interesting fact, that 92% of the leases right now at the airport are non-aviation leases. Those leases can remain once the airport closes and help fund the creation of a new park. So what we need to do is build a park first within our means, and then generations can improve that park as we move forward. We don't have to build the whole park all at one time. And what that can, park can mean for the community in terms of resources is really just a, a, a very magical thing. And these are just some renderings of what this potential park could look like. Now, parks provide a myriad of nature-based solutions. Biodiversity, they sequester carbon, they reclaim groundwater. We lost 20 million gallons of water during that hurricane that ran right off the sur surface of Santa Monica Airport. Uh, it provides for increased positive health outcomes. It creates jobs, education, and cultural services. It increases social interaction and great, great, and great, great. So during COVID, we could see how important. Um, uh, our parks were. They provided uh, COVID testing and vaccinations and emergency food banks and Red, Red Cross blood drives. They were essential for tens of thousands of people. And the all mitigation hazard mitigation plan for the city of Santa Monica specifies how important our city parks are. So parks have grown from different places. And over the years, hundreds of airports have closed 
and a hundred of those airports have turned into parks. And I could show you a hundred of them, we don't have time, uh, but Irvine, Fountain Valley, Garden Grove, San Francisco, Seattle, Chicago. Uh, this is the Obamas, by the way. Uh, looking at the uh, uh, airport that is closed. That's now the Northern Lee Island Park in Chicago. Absolutely stunning park. Uh, Berlin, and they just closed the doors uh, to the airport and opened it up to people, and it was a magnificent park. And then finally, local parks open up all the time. So this is not an unusual process that Santa Monica is doing. We're just late to the game. Uh, the Los Angeles Historic Park opened up, a really beautiful place downtown. Uh, Puente Hills Landfill is now going through the process of creating a great park. Uh, in five years, uh, in Glendale, they're going to close the landfill and create a 300-acre park. Uh, Rancho Palos Verdes just added 100 acres to their nature reserve. Uh, Taylor Park Reserve in downtown LA adding 100 acres. Uh, El, the city of LA wants to buy Sedaris County, 260 acres, more than um, um, Santa Monica Airport. And in Newport, they just took deed of the Ban Banning Ranch, twice the size of Santa Monica Airport. So creating a park is not something that's unusual. And then close by, uh, Pacific Palisades just opened the door in January of a fabulous park. You all need to go there. It's the George Wolfberg Park. Uh, and uh, it's bigger than any park we have right here in Santa Monica. So building is what... Building parks are what cities do. Uh, they provide for the needs of our community and it supports the housing and the future growth of a city. And it's time for us to reclaim our great park. And I wanna leave you with, with this last picture. This is from the 35 acres that we have removed at the end of the runway as part of the, to, uh, the, um, the consent decree. And with all these rains, flowers and wildflowers have grown. And unfortunately, we can't get over the fence to enjoy this beautiful park. And this park will be spectacular. Views of Catalina Island and then views of the Hollywood sign and downtown. It is really reclaiming the great park that we once had for our future generations. So thanks for the opportunity for letting me to speak to you. If you have any questions, I'll be here afterwards. I've got business cards and I appreciate everybody's time, especially the Democratic Party. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, and now uh, our next speaker will be from Community Corporation of Santa Monica, Tara Boraskin. Good afternoon, uh, good evening, I guess, at, at this point. Um, everyone, hi, I'm Tara Borowskis. I'm with the Community Corp of Santa Monica. And uh, I just want to plant another idea in your head, and I call it the yes and idea. Um, I do think a park sounds amazing. It's what the people voted for. We want it. I think everybody agrees with that. But what I'm suggesting is that this is a once in a generation opportunity to be really intentional. We've never had this opportunity with this much space before. And at 227 acres, I think there's a yes and opportunity here. We can have a great park, but we could also fill a critical need that aligns with the city's values, which is providing affordable housing. Um, so Natalia is just kind of showing some photos of some of our affordable housing that's been built over the last 40 years throughout the city, just to get your minds thinking about what that could look like. Um, you know, affordable housing for at least part of this property aligns with the needs and the priorities of, of the city and of the people who live here. Um, we're in a desperate shortage of affordable housing. We have um, a state mandate to build affordable housing um, and the city's hope is that most of that would be done on city owned land. Um, you know, we have, uh, let's see, principles of inclusiveness, opportunity, and well-being. I think we could do that by providing a park with housing next to it. We can make like a Playa Vista type situation or a well thought out master plan community, community input such as was referred to earlier. I think that's the healthy democracy. That sounds really exciting. 
I also think parks are enhanced when people live near them. So creating a walkable community with lots of housing options. So whether it's single family homes, which are there already, but also a variety of uh, housing choices that are multifamily. They could be uh, multifamily home ownership. I know that's an idea that's being discussed currently. Affordable rentals. There could even be a small land trust. Um, so just to give you a sense, the type of housing we build um, for sort of medium density would be about 50 units per acre. So let's just say we wanted to take, say, perhaps some of the frontage of Bundy as an example. And if we did 50 units an acre, we would only need 10 acres to do 500 units. That's a significant dent when we need to build about 8,000 units. So we could even take 15 and maybe, you know, do 750 uh, housing units. And again, I'm not saying this entire parcel needs to be affordable housing, but I think it would be the responsible thing to do to think about the city's needs and also what are our needs going to be in the future. Right now, we're experiencing a lot of congestion because people have to drive in from far away to their jobs here. The city currently prioritizes um, affordable housing for people who live or work here. So this could be a way to have more uh, opportunities for people to uh, live and work in the same community, go to the park, ride their bike, uh, you know, all the things that I think we as a community value, right? It would help with climate change if more people were able to live and work and play, uh, recreate, go to school all in the same community. So. I just invite you to think about maybe a small portion of this um, should go towards some affordable housing that would work in partnership with all the other uses that the community would like. So I'll also be around to talk about this some more later on. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. And now our next speaker will be the current president of the Santa Monica Airport Association, Mark Smith. Before Mark goes, I just wanted to make sure everybody knows we're about halfway through the voting window. So I know this is a very engrossing presentation, but make sure you check your email and have a chance to vote. If you didn't get the ballot for some reason, we're in the back curing ballots, <laughs> making sure everybody gets their correct ballot. So uh, don't forget to vote. Okay. Uh, my name is Mark Smith. I've lived in Santa Monica for 22 years, and I'm the sitting duck talking about why we should have an airport in Santa Monica. Uh, if you look at the airport, it's, it's very clear as to the amount of space it takes up. Uh, the artificial green is basically fake grass to keep airplanes from moving over, to keep airplanes where they're supposed to be. The areas that we're talking about that have been built, we've got a park over here, we've got a park over here. You can see the, the terrain over here, there are no wild, wildflowers at the moment, they've all died off. So without continual water, this land will be completely shot. Uh, next one. So this is your land, okay? No disputing it, you will do with it as you see fit. You know, with the democratic process, the city's planning to, to execute, everyone's going to have to make decisions. And this is going to be a group effort. But currently, this land is federally protected. Okay, you have a, a bubble of airspace over you. You have, you can't build on it. You can't put an amusement park on it. You can't put skyscrapers in front of the, the runway. So right now, nobody can tell you to build Oh, excuse me, affordable housing. Nobody can tell you to build a park because it's federally protected because it's an airport. Once that ends, you choose to close the airport, that protection is gone. I think it's really important in any project of this magnitude, and we're talking about a, a huge, like a project of biblical proportions. This would be the biggest land transformation in the history of California, probably in the country. You have to follow the money. Who is bringing the money in? Who is taking the money out? 
It's very important to have it. Yeah. Tell me, Josh. Perfect. Oh, that's right. Yes. You know. My point of view, this really Luna. This is a foster puppy. Yeah. Eight months. Okay, so talking, can you please mute, mute yourself? I love puppies too, but yeah, we're listening to the presentation. But I want to see a picture of the puppy later. <laughs> there is a dog walking park in there for a puppy. <laughs> so, a hybrid solution, I think, development, a certain amount of development, I think, green space, I think, are absolutely fantastic. And I think everybody would be in favor of that. So, it's really important to keep an open mind when looking towards the future of this airport. All right, next slide. Sorry, technical difficulties. So who am I? I've been I was a journalist for over 30 years. I traveled the world. I went into war zones, I went into hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes. I've seen people die, I've seen people go born. I mean, it's just I've had an amazing career as a journalist. And I've seen lots of different uses of public space in the process. I've been in and out of thousands of airports around the world. So I know the, there is value to being able to get in and out of some place when things become unpleasant. And we've been very lucky. We have not experienced anything unpleasant in our lifetimes here. But bad things happen to good people. And when there's no aviation assets, it, it becomes very critical. Next slide. Uh, currently, I get tired of traveling the world and I'm happy I'm not in Kosovo or in Ukraine. So I am now a solar contractor for the past 20 years. In fact, one of my bosses is right over here. Amber, I'm a, I'm a contractor who works for the city. So I know the city very well. I know the difficulties of working with the city. I know state law and I know the, the hardships of working with the city. So for the city to manage a project of this magnitude, it is not going to be easy and we don't have the skill set to really handle this this larger project. And my company has offset any, any carbon footprint the airport has produced. My company offsets every day of 15 Santa Monica airports in the amount of solar panels that we've installed. In Santa Monica alone, I've installed over 250 solar systems. So I love working with them. Again, airports are friendly and protected. This is ultra low use land. At nighttime, if you go to the airport, it is the quietest place in Los Angeles. There's nothing going on there. It is absolutely dead quiet. It is clean. There's coyotes there. In fact, I heard coyotes barking the other night. There's uh, ducks that hang out there. There's shorebirds. It's a very, very quiet place. It prevents development and it consumes very little resources. I think Michael's point's well taken that there's runoff that could be captured. But it doesn't consume a lot of electricity. It doesn't consume a lot of water. There's no there's no real watering going on there. So it's a really low impact use of space. So regardless of the hype about pollution, this airport operates below all federal standards when it comes to pollution. There's a mention of lead. Lead will be disappearing in time. And in the future, I don't think we'll be using fossil fuels. We'll get to that in a minute. Any construction project that takes place here is going to create a lot of diesel being burned, a lot of dust in the air, and a lot of traffic. It's, it's in this view. The pollution, when we measure pollution, when you look at the pollution levels around I-10, 405, the ultra microfine particles around those freeways is greater than we find at the airport. Okay? It's the airport because if you talk about 100 airplane operations per day now, you're, and you talk about 500,000 cars moving around in the 10 and the 405, there's no comparison to the amount of pollution that takes place between the airport and the community. Next. Recently, I was about how many years ago? Was it four years ago? The airport was shortened. It was a three and a half million dollar project. The shortening of the runway was successful in eliminating the larger jets because the runway is shorter. They can't can't accommodate a larger aircraft. This consumed a lot of diesel fuel, it consumed a lot of money. It was an expensive project, but it was effective for the purpose that the city council and the airport commission wanted to get done. Next slide. The fact remains, and this is an indisputable fact, 
Every day we have 500, don't shake your head, this is fact. We have 500 airplanes flying over us, more than 500 every day going to LAX. They're at 6,900 feet. This is just fact, okay? If you eliminate the airport, next slide. The, these airplanes, and these pictures were taken from my house, okay? Yesterday, or two days ago, excuse me, okay? These 500 airplanes fly over at 6,900 feet, it's about 1.3 miles. If you close the airport, there's no federal airspace restrictions above us. The airspace use will change. End of story. <laughs> and Michael doesn't know what the airspace will change to. It's a classy airport. It's only up to 3,500 square Right. But then it disappears, and you have no control over what happens. Nobody has control. So nobody can predict the future. I can't. You can't. It will be different. Bottom line. Like a park, the airport is listed as a critical and essential facility. <laughs> Santa Monica PD said to me last week, this is a Santa Monica asset. Ask PD, ask fire. Don't talk to me. Go ask the police department, ask the fire department if they think this is an asset. Just ask them. Yesterday, I talked with the chief pilot for the sheriff's department, okay? They fly pediatric patients from the valley into Children's Hospital. When the weather's cloudy, they talk to Santa Monica Tower, they shoot an approach, they land the child in the hospital. UCLA Hospital uses Santa Monica Tower. He said to me, without Santa Monica, the west side will be completely isolated. They will not have the ability to talk to somebody, to separate traffic, and to be able to get through this airspace. Sure. This is just the bottom line. Santa Monica Tower provides direction for the Sheriff's Department, LA Fire, LAPD, everybody that's that's moving around and provides services, protection services and healthcare services for us. You've got Angel Flight at the airport, you've got Mercy Air that comes in the airport, you've got helicopter flights dropping off organs every week at the airport. And the Sheriff also pointed out, he had one other point, that these small airports are critical for training students. They can't get enough pilots, they can't get enough mechanics to take care of their aircraft. So they need incubator airports to develop the skill sets that's required to run the industry. Uh, anyway. Sorry. At the bottom line, I, I have an expression, without an airport, more people die, more people suffer. An airport saves lives and delivers supplies. I've seen it. When I was at Katrina, it was the greatest air show on earth. The, 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 the downtown airport at, in New Orleans. It made all the difference in the world to these people. Without, again, we've never had an earthquake here that has caused any damage. We haven't had a hurricane. We haven't had a typhoon. We just, we don't really appreciate the value of the airport unless you absolutely, unless you need it. Next. Electric aviation is absolutely happening. With it, disappears pollution and noise. End of story. In within the next, most of this equipment is going to be coming online probably in about three to four years. Next slide. In the New York Times yesterday, why is the Air Force calling the New York Times and saying, "Hey, we just took delivery of electric aircraft"? Why is it, why is the Air Force advertising that they're basically picking up commercial aircraft to to bring on board in their fleet? This is huge news. I mean, this is this is no small potatoes. This is a revolutionary change for the world. The U.S. Air Force is going electric. Okay, that means the rest of the world is going electric. It means that we will be going electric. Next, the economic reality is pretty simple. If you look at the cost, the airport right now generates 14 million, 16 million a year. If you wanted to siphon that off and start building a Park, it would take you 100 years to build a park on that revenue. It's, there's no money. Where are you going to find the money? How much money is left in the Santa Monica budget? Do we have any money left over? Do we have surplus? Do we have a surplus budget? I don't think anyone's talking about a surplus budget in the Santa Monica budget. We have $500 million a year. It'll cost $500 million to $1.2 billion to build a park. You would have to do housing in order to build a park. You would have to do some sort of mixed use to develop this land properly. It's, you would have to sell off parts of this land 
to development. Bottom line, there's no other way to get the money. Next slide. And if, and to maintain a park is twenty million dollars a year. If you look at the money that we spend now on maintaining the parks in Santa Monica, it's significant. And without maintenance, you don't have a park. You have homeless. You have you have issues. You have coyotes or <laughs> more coyotes. And it also takes water. I took these pictures. This is a, I took pictures. These pictures on Tuesday this week. This is four p.m. on Twenty Third Street. It's backed up with the current level of housing that we have now. Okay, Ocean Park, four thirty p.m. Now, you want to do construction at the airport? What's this traffic going to look like with trucks and construction? What's this traffic going to look like when you build more housing? I mean, these are questions that we really have to answer. Okay, next. There's no water. There's no infrastructure. There's no sewer lines running through the airport. There's no electrical lines. You would have to increase your police force. You have to increase your fire your fire department in order to handle anything that gets built there. There's absolutely no infrastructure there. Cost for providing infrastructure is about 10 billion. Who's going to pay for that? You'd have to sell off the land to develop it. End of story. On the north side of the airport, this is our sewer system, everybody. This is what we utilize in the north side of the airport. This is what exists now. There's no bathrooms. So but somebody thought that was kind of good. Thank you for laughing. <laughs> Next slide. Okay, we can go back to the So the bottom line is this is a federally protected zone. Do with it what, what you may. You you close it, all federal protections go away, and it will be the wild, wild west of special interests getting involved. And the 40 people that we pick. They're going to be attacked by spend. I mean, you never know what's going to happen. You just never know. I don't know what's going to happen, but I know that if you change the airport, you can develop it as it is. You can add parks. You can add housing. You can you can bring in whatever. But if you lose federal protection, it's the wild wild west. And I think the airport is an asset, and can be an even a bigger asset in years to come with electric aviation. Just imagine the possibility of going to the Dodger game in 15 minutes. I mean, how many people go to Dodger games here? Okay. 15 minutes, not a bad game. You can work all day, hop a ride, and be the Dodger game. I mean, this is from here. Well, you wouldn't be driving, you'd be taking an electric aircraft. So it doesn't take 15 minutes to go from here to Dodger Stadium. By air. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, they built a crane that would do it in 30 minutes. Well, we could, but we didn't. We, instead of building instead of building the wires for for a uh, you know, we have a landline system, right? Now we have a cellular system. You leapfrog your technology, you choose your technology over time. We don't know the uh, we really don't know the best use for this land for the next hundred years. Whatever decisions we make need to be made for the next hundred years. So we need to think really clearly how we're going to use this. Okay. That's the bottom line. Yeah. Thank you very much for signing up. <laughs>
Um, I'll just start with a little background. There it is. Oh, that's great. Okay. So I'm Wayne. As John said, we were in the trenches in 2017 and 2018. Um, I was the founder of SoCal Blue, the common calendar that we use. And I'm the operations director of Field Team 6. And I also founded something called Blue Voter Guide, which I hope you'll all be using in 2024. But the hat I'm wearing tonight is with Public Access Democracy. And it's an educational C3 that works to bring ordinary people to the center of governance. When I think back to all the electoral wars that I've been involved in, the one thing that gives me the most hope about the future of this country is what happens in these citizen assemblies. So I want to tell you a little bit more about them, maybe from 10,000 feet, and fill in a little bit of what Amber has already told you. I'm going to try to use the mic to good effect, because I was downtown at an American Democracy Summit, and today I'm losing my voice. So, <clears throat> so what the heck? Uh, why do we need this new thing? We've got all the advocates here. Let's just duke it out and vote. Well, first, what is it? Next. Citizen assemblies are a different kind of democratic process that brings together a group of everyday people to tackle a difficult policy question, which is exactly what we have in Santa Monica. We have a difficult decision that has to be made. And how is the city going to do this? Next one. This is the Paris Climate Assembly, France in one room. These things are mushrooming all over the world. Why? because they're designed to reduce the influence of political bias and instead put the focus on collaborative problem solving and evidence. There's been a ton of academic research that shows that they handle complicated policy questions effectively and fairly. So how does it work? Amber went over some of this. This is a summary slide of it. Um, you use a democratic lottery to select a bunch of people. They come together in an assembly at small tables with a neutral facilitator at each table. Experts come and address the assembly to ensure everyone is aware of the facts and diverse views and proposed options. Uh, they're also given training in cognitive bias and critical thinking. And then stakeholders on all sides make their case. Everybody that you heard tonight talking about what they think we should do with this land, We'll be there talking to the panelists. Then the participants deliberate. And what does that mean? That means they talk and they listen to each other and they get to know each other and they give reasons for their ideas. And the facilitator is content agnostic at every table and is simply there to ensure that all voices are heard. And then the group as a whole decides on a recommendation or set of recommendations for the best way forward. Next one. So don't we already have public input? What is so new and exciting about this process? Well, in our current public involvement and in our democracy in general, there's three different ways that the public makes its views known. First, there's processes open to everybody, surveys, hearings, and voting. And the good thing about that is that anyone who wants can participate. The not so good thing is you don't want to have an election for every decision. And hearings and surveys often end up involving the same individuals, stakeholders. And often the process is not deliberative, it's even debate oriented. Then there's processes by invitation. These are like, for example, publicly appointed panels. And the good part is you can reach out to stakeholders in marginalized communities to get input. But the downside is they're often composed of the same individuals, the usual suspects, and the orientation is often more like a focus group with the process directed by city staff or consultants. That brings us to citizen assembly. So this is what's new and different, and I think better about citizen assemblies. It's really just two points. First, the panelists are selected by lot. The panelists don't pick themselves, and they're not picked by somebody else. They're as independent as it gets. You may not be in the room, but somebody just like you will be on that panel. And the second thing is deliberation. The panelists do not argue, they do not debate, they learn together. As I said, they go in deep, they deliberate, which means they collaborate to find the best 
evidence-based solutions. Next one. So there have been over 600 of these all over the world since 2010, more every year. Why? Next one. So this is the range of issues that these assemblies deal with. You can see that at the top is urban planning with 43 different separate assemblies involving urban planning issues. Then there's health, environment, infrastructure, and so on. There is not much that these panels and assemblies have not dealt with. Next one. So why does it work? How is it that ordinary citizens can make complicated policy decisions? Well, first of all, the evidence is in. If you have to choose between expertise and diversity, you want to bet on diversity every time. If you have to choose between insiders and outsiders, you want to bet on the outsiders every time. And partly, this is because homogeneous groups, such as insiders and experts, tend toward groupthink. But even more important, a diverse group brings the richness of lived experience to bear on the decision making. If you educate a group of people, take the politics out, allow all voices to be heard, you get smart, fair, creative recommendations over and over again. Next one. So this is just a slide of the benefits. Um, they're fair, they make citizenship meaningful, they rebuild trust, they increase inclusivity, they're transparent, they're representative, they're non-polarizing, they're immune to special interests, they're new and yet they're completely understandable. People who have been on these assemblies come away believers in democracy for life with relationships that were built at the assembly that last for life. So the next slide shows Petaluma and um, Amber went over that. So I won't uh, go into detail, but they had this assembly. It was uh, uh, in uh, the summer of uh, 2022 uh, and they, uh, they met and they gave the recommendations to the city. <coughs> they need to go drink water. That can be, let me just quickly do that. Next slide. These are some of the drawings. The panels paid that embody the visions for the property that they came up with. The city manager, Peggy Flynn, who you heard a little bit about, has these up in her office. He expects to begin implementation of panel recommendations next year. So the last slide. Representative groups, in sum, without political pressure, in an atmosphere where experts are on tap, but not on top, talking to each other about an issue as people, not as factions, in a structured, facilitated, yes and process, providing in their own words guidance to the convening body. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to thank all of our speakers this evening. One more round of applause. You know, very difficult to make a presentation like this when you know a fair amount of the room may disagree or have another opinion. And I just think it was really great that we had all of them up here. And in a few minutes, we're going to take some questions and answers uh, from the audience. Uh, so. Sorry. So first, we're going to take a look at the election results. We're doing it live. <laughs> okay. Now I'm going to share my screen. Well, hang on a second. Okay, this is live. I have no idea what's, what we're about to see. <clears throat> Whoops. No. <laughs> Not supposed to see that. Okay. Here we go. So we had 103 ballots submitted. Results. Joe Biden was endorsed with 98% of the vote.
Yeah. Hopefully that resembles the final general election results in 2024. And uh, Adam Schiff got 64% of the vote. So he's also our endorsed candidate. So we don't need to do a round two. So everyone uh, who's working the, your camp with the campaigns can tell your voters they can go to sleep. Uh, but we, of course, are still going to take a few Q and A's. So we'll uh, invite our uh, panelists back up. And uh, we'll we'll uh, uh, you can uh, you can just stand up here. That's fine. And uh, let's see what kind of questions we have. Oh yeah. And uh, does anyone have a question to kick us off? Okay, come. Uh, why don't you come up and grab the mic, and then we'll pass it along. My question is to Tara, and and it um speaks directly to the core of the house. The microphone closer. It speaks directly to the core of the house, and keeping in mind what property value here is in Santa Monica, what kind of I guess you could say scenario formula do they look at in determining who what what affordable housing is and then would qualify for it. Sure. Um, so our housing um, typically serves people that earn 30 to 80 percent of the area median income, and that is dictated by the funding sources we use to build it. Um, so typically it's targeting um, incomes, uh, household incomes anywhere between about, say, 18,000 a year all the way up to 80 or 90,000 a year. So does that answer your question in terms of who the housing would be benefiting? In part. I mean... Is there a certain process that you have to apply for in order to be considered for that type of housing, keeping in mind? Because I'm seeing a lot of stuff go up, but it, it looks like I wouldn't be able to afford any of that. So I'm wondering, would this be any different? Ah, okay. So, well, at least for 100% affordable housing, it is, um, the rents are low, so it would be affordable. So our rents start from about $500 a month, maybe less to about $1,100 a month. So if you can compare that to the market rents in Santa Monica, it is truly affordable. Um, and then you have one other sort of nuance was, oh, maybe about who can actually qualify to live there. The city has a prioritization. So um, there's a whole kind of list of priorities that the city has set for who can get in the housing. Um, it starts with people who are being evicted against um, their will or for no good cause. Um, then um, the right to return program, people with uh, continuum of care vouchers, and then people who live or work in Santa Monica. So ideally, some of this housing could be going to serve people who are already living or working there. Thank you. Do you want to come up? Come on up? Yeah, well, I just actually wanted to ask, I don't need the mic. I, I remember... I was here during the 94 earthquake, and it, it was said tonight that Santa Monica hasn't suffered any damage from a major earthquake. I, I was in a house that was trashed during it. My memory of it is that the airport wasn't open during that time. I wonder if anybody knows. And the other question related to that is it was said that we'd be totally, the west side would be totally isolated if the airport was closed down, and that planes would be able to fly low over over Santa Monica. Is, is that true? Does anybody know if that's true? Does, does my question. Norman well, we wants to take it if you can bring in a question. Uh, and also two, multiple two people. questions. Um, are you the airport guy or am I the airport guy? <laughs> Let me ask the question and then you can, you can answer the question. As it's on? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, was the airport closed when there was the earthquake? Yes, the airport was closed down because the runway had to be surveyed and made sure it was safe at that time. Um, what's the other question? So about where the planes been flying. Oh, okay. Um, here, you know, here's a big, another thought. We're only five miles away from LAX. <laughs> we're closer to a major airport than most people are in the country. And so to think that we're isolated from uh, having an airport 
Um, we're very close to LAX. As far as the, the, the low flying planes, we could go back and forth on that entire issue. <laughs> Santa Monica Airport is a class D airport to 3,500 feet. Um, but when planes come in, they, they come in at a continuous glide path. Um, I can't remember, it's 6%, I believe. And so regardless of whether or not the airport is here or not, the planes are going to be exactly at the same height that they are. And you can look at the planes coming in from the east that do not go over an airport, going over Hacienda Height, same height uh, by distance to the runway as the airport Santa Monica is to LAX. And if you look at, say, for example, if you're flying over from Simi Valley to maybe Burbank Airport, and you fly right over Van Nuys Airport, Class D Airport, those planes are very low. They're 3,500 feet because Burbank Airport is very close to that. So there's a lot of misinformation about this. Yeah. Um, and I'll let, it, I'll let you go with it. But that's <laughs> He's correct. There's a lot of misinformation. <laughs> Uh, the airport was closed because it was being used for emergency use. That's that's what happened during the airport. As far as airspace goes, um, six percent would be almost a spatial descent. Uh, planes do not fly over Burbank at thirty five hundred. If you want, uh, I can show you the pictures. They need to transition to Ohio. Sorry. The uh, yes, we are very close to LAX, but if you lose the tower and you lose the airport and you lose this airport air, this airspace protection that means anybody anybody who could do sightseeing helicopters could fly in at a thousand feet over Santa Monica all day long. That's the bottom line. You lose complete control of the airspace. You don't have anybody to direct traffic. You don't have anybody to direct sheriff, fire, or PD in this area. You lose your instrument approach capabilities to the hospitals that receive traumatic you know, trauma patients. From all over Southern California. Well, the tower is only operating until 11 o'clock at night. So the emergency services that you're referring to is known and work within those hours. The, the like majority of the activity takes place at that time. You're right. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Yes. Yeah. Um, speaking of flying all day and night, uh, on weekends and actually in the evenings, I need to reach the photographer. That's what I do after I teach or anything. And right now, I've been running around about 192 helicopters in the plane that have interrupted my footage. Of, of the where, where, are you, where are you shooting? Santa Monica Park, Bay, uh, down by the beach. So if you lose it, I'm not going to ask a question. My question is <laughs> Does the Santa Monica Airport facilitate these constant private helicopters and LAPD helicopters and sheriff's helicopters that go up and down the bay? Almost hourly, and if it was closed, would that hinder their um their access? And my second question is the uptick, and it happens right after the airport uprising, and I think there's a connection of the increased LAPD and other sheriff's uh, activity as a direct result of that. And um, my concern is this is further facilitating that kind of thing. I, I, in all honesty, I, I can't answer that question. But I don't think the Santa Monica Airport would have any impact on the traffic going up and down the, the coast. No, my question is, are they using it right now? The, 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 in this presentation, you said that um, it, it's there's special there's, access for LAPD and sheriff. So it, I'm wondering if they're the using The airport is, facil is, is, is aiding them in not, That's opening, thought, in not into bumping into each other, thank but they would still be using that airspace. So they're helping this happen. Is that what they're No, no, they're. They're preventing accidents, but the the traffic would be the same because it doesn't. In, the, the airport does not increase or decrease that traffic. So if it was closed, then they would it'd still be there. They would still be there. They would still be going up and down the coast. Yeah. 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 Because that's the only way to get down. That's, that's the only way to pass through LAX's airspace is down along the beach. So it's it's a neutral. It's neutral effect, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, in the back, and then whoever starts answering the questions, just try to reiterate. Especially assuming you're off mic, what the question was. Uh, Larry, uh, do you support the yes and approach? Larry? Yes, 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 do you support the yes and approach that is presented? Uh, Inclusive of the housing and education group office? I'm a park supporter. I think we need parks for the future. Um, I think this the city is going to grow. Uh, there's housing in a lot of places that we can build in, and it's going to build. I mean, we look at every city, and cities are going to grow. Is that a no? 
Yes and no questions. You can throw the houses on the top. Any, 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 do you support or oppose the yes and? It depends on the park. Of the, the, there's various parts of the airport that are aviation and non aviation land that are covered by Measure LC. And so you would have to look at those lands. We would like to build a park without having to do another election. I don't quite understand. Are you, do you, do you want to have housing? Yes, or no? Housing in addition to park. I think there's a lot of opportunity to build housing. Um, and again, it, it depends on the area that's covered by LC. The area that's not covered, the area, the area that's covered by LC, I believe should be a park. And there are also areas at the airport that are not covered by LC. Okay. Well, I have one quick follow-up question. So the, the slide that you put up there showing how uh, Vancouver was able to gain 3.4 acres for 10,000 people, they were able to do that like massively dense economy in the area, like a DDA was correct there, was making 60 acres, and so they made the ability to create parts. Would you support densifying the surrounding area to a similar density in order to create this sort of park? You know, I think that as the city grows, those are going to have to be decisions that the city makes. And if you look at a city like Toronto, which has 12.7% of their land in yeah. park space. So, yeah. So, you know, again, I'm looking at the park, and there's a whole world around the park that can grow. And can I ask you a question? When you calculated the park space, do you include the DV? When when the net, the trust for public land looks at that, they do not consider the beach. Because I go to the beach three times a week. Right, San Diego. Um, so the beach, San, the beach is not included. San Diego, San Francisco, Los Angeles, all of those places have beach based place, but they also have um, greater park space than we do. So it's not just the beach. But there's a lot of park. Uh, there's only a tiny portion of the park in the beach. The beach. You're next, and then I'll go to you about it. Go ahead. Your Hi, thank, thank you, all of you. Uh, well, that's a pilot. <laughs> but um, the Amber and the gentleman from the uh, my question to you is it was really great to hear the presentation that the city process and stuff like that, and the ideas between the community developing ideas. The people left out of that, though, seem to be the Around the airport, residents of them, it's where the of Mar Vista. These people are going to be heavily impacted by any decision Diana Monica makes. Is there a process where that should be opened up to include voices from those communities? Because Venice gets most of the airplane bodies, and Mar Vista does too. I just wanted to see how we develop that. Sure. So the question, just for those online, was are we reaching out to our neighbors? Basically, in, in Los Angeles, Venice, Marvin, that area, and um, it's a question that we're going to ask council. Is right, if Santa Monica is paying for this, who do we want to include on the panel? Um, it feels like we should at least reach out in some capacity, right? Because agree, right? They touch two sides of the airport, but we also are resource constricted. So um, it's a question that when we go to the study session, um, we'll be on the table to talk to council about and say. How do we want to do PAM you know, and in what capacity? Um, we have reached out currently. We have worked with CD11. Um, we've met with the West Side Planning uh, Coalition for LA City Planning. And so we're starting to build those bridges. Um, but as for their actual participation on the community panel, that remains to be seen yet. Good question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Hi. Um, so, I'm Ralph. Um, one yes and I haven't heard it at all ever, other than the bullet point in Amber's presentation. And uh, Peter James made a wonderful presentation to the Arts Commission. And so I guess one comment, I mean, when he was speaking, I mean, this is like a long, it was like a hundred, I think he even said a thousand years. And when, when he, when he cut, contextualized what we're potentially looking at. But I would say, you know, the bullet point about arts and culture, in terms of, I believe the city is committed to build you know, things for the arts, you know, housing or airport or a park, but 
Can you speak to that? I mean, for the, in the planning process, is there not a, a commitment to art, culture, and a museum there for this? So for the process, um, I I cannot speak to what the panel will come up with. Um, but what I will say, <laughs> yeah, but what it, it it's there now, right? And there is a commitment in Santa Monica to support our arts. Um, as that initial information is being presented to the the panel, that is in a balanced nature. I am uh -huh. sure that we will have folks from the different art communities presenting, right? They, I, I, they are, you know, as we create our stakeholder list and who they might want to reach out to when this happens, if this happens, right, hopefully, um, that certainly the arts and culture community will be a part of it. that there had been a survey with one of the newspapers that did not include the arts. It was big, and we wrote a letter to the editor. I mean, I'm just kind of saying it seems to have just been off the, no pun intended, radar. Or leave the Thank you. So, why, why don't we turn to Civic Center and have our That's a different topic. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to start doing that. Yeah, um, I think like an internal kind of question. I, I kind of feel like the elephant in the room is the fact that nine years ago we had a vote in the city, Measure D, which is Mark Smith was representing. And that I, 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 I did not represent. Oh, well, okay. You're, 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 not being. Don't even be be We're now we're having. But he's saying it's, it's a false question. I'm not involved in the question. Let's let's erase that. I feel like under the twilight zone. It's it's nine years after LT passed. The gentleman that's talking about the arts is completely correct. I was in the room and. Wrote LC when we hammered it out, and I know what the intention was. But that land was supposed to be used as it was designated in 1946 to be a park. That's what the residents were fighting out a park versus an airport. We voted, we won, the park won, and now we're here talking about it like we never voted. And the city is talking about we have to vision again. We visioned before 2015. We're nine years behind on the park. And I would like to know from the city who came up with the kernel of idea for the uh, whatever the democracy, national democracy, happy democracy that worked in that was hired for Petaluma that cost Petaluma $600,000. They advised the Petaluma City Council what the residents wanted. And the council was willing to do what they wanted anyway. And I'm sorry, but the representative from the city did say the council does not have to go by go by what comes out of this random panel. We don't need a random panel. We've already voted. We need to get to work on the park. And I don't understand why the city is not getting to work on the park. I would argue that we are in that. Oh, so. I don't know if I can repeat that whole question, but the question was about LC. It's, it's okay. I, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll paraphrase. Uh, the question was about we voted on LC, so why are we bringing this up again? I think if that's a fair characterization. Um, the reason why is even if we said this is a park and we're not making any changes to LC, right? LC is the voted on measure and governs this land. Absolutely. Even in a park, what does that mean? What goes there? What uses do we want to see? Do we it's want to make the side? But LC does not mention anything about an airport. It does not mention anything about housing. It was very clear when we crafted it, it was about arts, cultural, open space, and park. That was the narrative. That's what people voted for. That's what we should be talking about. What do we want in that park? How do we want to use the park? What can the park do for us? If housing is an ancillary thing, that possibly could be put to vote later, but it's not the primary reason that we're here. We're that we voted. We voted for a park. Thank you. I, I, I is that true that Petaluma did, council did not agree with the panel? I mean, we talked about this 36 people, we're talking about using a bigger panel of ours, and then they turned around and didn't follow the panel. Is that, is that what happened? Um, 
First of all, it wasn't six hundred thousand. It was uh, less than that. I think it, it, it was four hundred thousand, approximately. Yeah. Okay, fine, four thousand. Right. And that was the city's choice uh, to spend that money, and uh, that's really our choice. Uh, totally, right. So that's that, that's speaking to that. As far as the not the residents' choice, the residents haven't spoken on this yet. Um, the the decision. That's the study sessions. Yeah. Um, back to Petaluma just uh, for a second. The so the, the um, panel made the recommendations to the city. Um, the city was in a really bad way. There was really a lot of bad blood between the uh, proprietor of the, the fairgrounds that had had this lease for all this time, which was actually a branch of the agriculture department of the state. They had neglected the land. It was it was run down. It was very poorly managed, and the, and the city wanted to take it over and not renew the lease. That has happened. I don't know that it, it would have happened without the citizen assembly. There were many issues and ideas that the panelists came up with that they gave to the city. And it's true, the, the panels, at least this panel, was uh, advisory. And so, you know, the city council took it in and then made the decision. But it, the, the presence of the panel in Petaluma, I think, enabled the city to go forward, regardless of what they decided. It got them out of a really bad situation up there. So I think that, that was a huge value. Um, in, in many of these assemblies, it depends on the terms that are set when, when the convener, the city, uh, or the municipality, or the state, or the nation, whatever the terms are, you know, what the deal is going to be. Uh, sometimes they, uh, uh, the, the, you know, the convening body has to respond in writing if they don't agree with the, the statements. So all of that is going to be set up. All of that is not in place. That has to be determined. Um, I hope I answered something. Well, we're not in that situation at Luba. We already had this situation in 2014, and we made up our minds. You're saying they, they were the city had all the bad blood in Pedro. We've been through that, we've gone through that, we've made the decision. We don't need this extra thing, which can then be ignored by the council. The cost of huge cost. There's many decisions, um, I think, as Amber was saying, that have to be made. Uh, even if there's part, you all agree on that. That's that it, you know, it wasn't specified. There are a lot of things that need to be decided about. How that's implemented. What's so, this by the okay. Thank understand. you. Well, we're going to take one more question and go ahead from the back. I have, I have two really quick questions. That's okay. Related. Uh, both the cost of the question. I'm curious about uh, if there is interest in making a shift. Does that have to go back? Uh, that's not consistent with LT. Does that have to go back to the voter? And the second question is just about how how LT uh, interfaces with the the surplus land act that was enacted by the state which prioritizes surplus land for the let me just jump in and jump on your last yeah. question the surplus land act also specifies the parks and open space and so to characterize it just for housing it's for both housing and open space actually prioritizes the housing I think you have to read it. It prioritizes both of them. Um, sure. So, Elsie, if if that is, that is an if if there was any change to Elsie, it absolutely would have to go to the voters again, unequivocally. Yes. Um, as for the housing element, my understanding is yes, parks are prioritized, but that housing is the dominant. Factor or feature, and so I, I, in our initial presentations in January, if you go back and watch them, we're very careful to say the housing out, like the the surplus land tax keeps getting more and more stringent. So right now they may allow things. We are hesitant to think that that will hold, mm -hmm. and that they could very well come in and say, you know what, that's ours, or now you have to do this with that. So it, it's possible. I'm not saying that we know that. I don't have a crystal ball. I can't, I can't say for sure. But the, the Surplus Lands Act has continually gotten more and more strict. And so that is more the concern, is that it will continue in that manner. Does that answer it? 
I just want to say one thing about an LC and the panel. The panel will know that LC is built in, and that will be included in their deliberations about you know how they're gonna uh, if they if they recommend that there is a change that needs to go to the voters, they will do that. Other or if they will make recommendations that are within LC, that'll be up to the panel, but they're not ignorant of it. Uh, they'll be respectful of it, they'll be part of the deliberation, be part of what they're doing. Great, thank you, everybody. Um, thank you to our panelists. And before you guys go, just a few more. Hold on, everybody. Okay, so just a reminder before we head out, our next two meetings are going to be October 18th. Uh, we have uh, education issues with one of our guests being Superintendent Dr. Antonio Shelton. Plus, as an added bonus, my in laws will be there They're for their first Santa Monica Democratic Club meeting. And also, uh, on November 15th, the LA County DA race uh, debate will be happening. Uh, folks, if, if anyone is interested in joining me at Handel's Ice Cream, please come see me after the meeting. And uh, in order to adjourn, in order to, ad folks, in order to adjourn, okay, thanks everybody. So like I was saying, uh, if you would like to join me in Handel's Ice Cream, please see me after the meeting. And in order to adjourn, we usually do a musical adjournment based on a musician who's recently passed away. And uh, we had a lot of options tonight. want to recognize some of those losses since our last meeting. Tony Bennett, Randy Meisner of the Eagles, Robbie Robertson from the band, Jimmy Buffett, Steve Harwell of Smash Mouth. But of course, nothing compares. To Sinead Bye. Music song.